It's Thursday, the 15th of October. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lario channel. And today we have a couple of NTSB preliminary reports on a couple of aircraft accidents that we've covered on this channel. First, the preliminary report on the B-25 Old Glory that went down on 19 September. On September 19th, 2020, about 1925 Pacific Daylight Time, that's getting near sunset locally, a North American B-25N November 7946 Charlie was substantially damaged when it was involved in an accident near Stockton, California. That's the B-25, better known as Old Glory. One pilot and one passenger sustained serious injuries. One pilot sustained minor injuries. The airplane was operated under Title 14 CFR 91. It was a Part 91 personal flight. The pilot reported that while en route to their destination, which was Stockton, they'd taken off from Chino, flown up to Vacaville Airport, did not get any gas at Vacaville, and was proceeding to Stockton Airport, and we reviewed the flight tracker data. They went relatively low altitude, less than 2,000 feet from Vacaville down to Stockton Airport, a pretty short flight. The pilot reported that while en route to their destination, fuel pressure for the left engine fluctuated and the left engine briefly lost power before regaining power. The pilot stated that he was concerned that they may have had a fuel pump failure or something similar and decided to turn the cross feed valve on. A short time later, about five miles from their intended destination, fuel pressure fluctuations were observed on both engines and both engines intermittently losing and regaining power Due to multiple residential areas between their location and the airport, the pilot conducted a 180 turn and initiated an off-airport landing. The pilot stated that during the landing roll, he observed a ditch in front of him and was able to get the airport, airplane airborne briefly to avoid it. However, he was unable to avoid a second large ditch. Subsequently, the airplane struck the second ditch, became airborne, and impacted the ground in a nose-low attitude and all three landing gear collapsed. So the gear was down. Initially, it looked like the gear was retracted for this emergency landing, but since they were on a five mile final, I believe they were already configured for landing at Stockton Airport. And the, the gear was ripped off the aircraft. And also, both the left and right engines were separated from their respective attach points and the fuselage sustained substantial damage. The, the, wet the wreckage was recovered to a secure location. And that's the end of the preliminary report and they got some statistics there. The weather was fine and the injuries and the investigator. But here's an important note. The NTSB did not travel to the scene of the accident. And the NTSB is not traveling to the scene of most of these accidents these days because of COVID-19. So will we ever get to the bottom of this regarding how much fuel was left on board this aircraft at the at the time that it crashed. Was anybody able to determine how much fuel was left on board the airplane after it crashed? The fuel crossfeed in a multi-engine aircraft, well, first off, if you look at the B-25 manual, it says, and most aircrafts, most twin engine aircraft manual, it says the crossfeed valve is for emergency use only. And it kind of leaves it at that. On twin engine aircraft, most fuel systems operate tank to engine. So there's a set of left fuel tanks that feeds the left engine and a set of right fuel tanks that feeds the right engine. Same thing on the B-25. These tanks are designed such that the engine can generally suction feed out of these tanks. If all boost pumps fail, the engine driven fuel pumps in the engine will pull the fuel that they need out of those fuel tanks, regardless of whether the electric boost pumps are operational in that fuel tank or not. The whole idea of having a fuel cross feed system is that in the event that you should lose an engine and you need to travel a long ways or that you have a large fuel imbalance between the left and the right engines or wings, you can use the cross feed to balance the system or you can use the cross feed in an emergency to extend your range and get the fuel that's not being used out of the inoperative engine into the operational engine. A fuel cross feed system does not transfer or pump fuel between fuel tanks. 
if you need to balance your fuel tanks, you burn the fuel out of the high level fuel tank until it matches the level of the lower level fuel tank and then go back to tank to engine operation. Now those are all procedures regarding a single engine failure. But if in the event that you know you're desperately low on fuel, there is a lesser known procedure in most twin engine aircraft that does say to turn on the cross feed in a desperate attempt to try to feed as much fuel as you can to the engines, but get prepared for a dual engine flame out. So the procedure is to cross feed on, turn on all the electric boost pumps on all the fuel tanks, and attempt to extract all the fuel that you can from the fuel tanks to whatever engine you can to keep them running. By the way, this low fuel procedure where you open the cross feed valve and turn on all the electric fuel boost pumps is not to be used if you suspect a fuel leak. This procedure also tells you to configure the aircraft correctly and anticipate losing both engines on final. Now up for discussion is what would you rather do? Would you rather run the tanks out one at a time and, and allow one engine to die and then proceed on to the, if you're five miles from the runway, to proceed on in on one engine? Or to go ahead and do the uh, cross feed procedure? That's all Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, one way or another may put you closer into all those buildings in the town there. Uh, to a point where you may not make the runway. The important point overall is to use your superior judgment beforehand and do not allow yourself to get into a fuel tight situation that forces you to use your superior systems knowledge and superior flying skills to get yourself out of that situation. The second NTSB preliminary report is about the single engine air tanker crash near Emmett, Idaho on 22 September. On September 22nd, 2020, about 1830 Mountain Daylight Time, again getting near sunset, an air tractor AT802A, November 836 Mike Mike, was substantially damaged when it was involved in an accident near Emmett, Idaho and the pilot was fatally injured. The aircraft was operated under FAR Part 91, Aerial Firefighting Flight. Witnesses conducting firefighting operations adjacent to the accident site reported that the accident airplane, a single engine air tanker, we commonly call, call these seats, descended and made an approach similar to the previous seat that, that were dropping fire retardant. This was a small fire, maybe 25 or 30 acres. The witnesses said the airplane passed over the top of the ridge and descended into a valley. However, the pilot did not drop the fire retardant as the previous seats had done. The witnesses stated he heard a brief application of engine power as the airplane began to ascend over rising terrain at the pilot's 12 o'clock position. Straight ahead of him. The airplane subsequently impacted rising terrain near the peak of the ridge line. A video provided by a witness captured the accident sequence, and I have yet to see this video. The recording showed the airplane descending over an intermediate ridgeline and into a valley. About three seconds later, the airplane momentarily returned to level flight before pitched to a nose high attitude. The airplane subsequently impacted rising terrain approximately 80, 80 feet below the ridgeline. So he missed the subsequent ridgeline by 80 feet. Examination of the accident site by the Federal Aviation Administration inspector, so an FAA guy did go to, the, to this accident site, revealed that the airplane impacted rising terrain. The wreckage debris path continued with the initial impact point over the top of the ridge line and extending into a small ravine. The airplane came to a rest approximately 100 yards from the initial impact point of a heading 040 degrees. All structural components of the aircraft were located throughout the wreckage debris path and the records recovered for further examination. Now what they don't say in this accident report, but what others have reported is that the, well, it, it's implied in this report that the retardant was not dropped. So the question is why was not the retardant dropped on this, on this drop? Anytime you've got a problem in a, in a 
air tanker emergency, the very first thing always to do is to drop the retardant load. So why did this load not get dropped? Was there something about the run that the pilot didn't like? Or was there a problem with opening up the, the uh, doors to the retardant system? It's going to be hard to determine if the pilot attempted to drop the load of retardant and it did not actually drop. So control flight into rising terrain, a very all too common way of getting killed in the work, the very dangerous work of aerial firefighting. So we'll continue to have more updates on these reports as we get, uh, these are the preliminary reports. Uh, we'll Hopefully we'll get a interim report where they'll have all the facts laid out and then a final report if they get into that level of detail on these two accidents. I'm fresh back from my Boeing 777 recall check ride and I'm waiting IOE initial operating experience where I'll go fly an actual revenue flight with a check airman before being released to go back to fly in the line. The check ride went very well. You go into that check ride as prepared as you possibly can and with a good attitude and you'll get a good outcome. But the neat thing is after the check ride we got to do the AQP portion of the program, Advanced Qualification Program, going well beyond the minimum FAA requirements. AQP takes real world scenarios and has you practice them or see them and review them in the simulator. And this AQP program was packed. And I got more details uh, over on Patreon of what all we did, but we did the Air France scenario a deep stall from high altitude. It took over 8,000 feet to recover from a deep stall in a swept wing aircraft from initially starting at 40,000 feet, recovered at 32,000 feet. You couple with that unusual airspeed indications or inaccurate airspeed indications, inaccurate instrument readings, and it's a terribly confusing situation. We also did the Emirates uh, bounce and go where you hit, you hit the runway so hard that you bounce back up in the air high enough to where you decide to go around after you've touched down and learn the auto throttle logic that the Boeing 777 has after such event. That's a startling event that, that really catches you by surprise. But you get it up in the air, hit the toga switch and do your normal go around procedures. We did the uh, Air Asiana scenario where you come in high and hot on a visual approach. You click the auto throttles off to, and you descend rapidly to regain the glide slope. You capture the glide slope, but you never catch the fact that the auto throttles don't wake up once you're on the glide slope and subsequently stall the aircraft. Then we did the, uh, the 737 MAX scenario of the combined combination of runaway stabilizer or runaway trim, as we more commonly call it, coupled with unusual airspeed indications. A terribly confusing set of circumstances. I have a newfound respect for the pilots that were subject to this emergency. It's a terribly confusing emergency and set of events. But if you turn everything off and fly the aircraft and do the procedure as published, it can take this, this rather terrifying event and turn it into a rather non-event. But it's still, you still got to get it done very, very quickly. And it took me 10 seconds or more to figure out what was going on. When they spring this on you without any warning, without any advanced briefing, it's, it's a very surprising event. And... Um, very confusing. So AQP, it's it's what makes part 121 operations so operationally safe, along with everything else that part 121 encompasses. But this is the, the one big difference between FAR part 121 operations, part 135 and part 91 operations that I think could be blended into, take AQP and bring it into part 135 and bring it into part 91 and reduce this accident rate that we're seeing so, that is so bad in part, if, especially in FAR part 91 operations over the last year or so. So thanks so much for your support uh, here on the YouTube channel and especially over on Patreon that makes this content possible. See you here.